I'd like to welcome everybody here to our uh, next installment of the Bridge Webinar Series. The Bridge Webinar Series is designed to prepare for the next generation of big data analytics woven into transdisciplinary and intersectoral sciences, policy and innovation, and serving as a catalyst for solutions at scale to better address the seemingly intractable problems that lie at the nexus of health and wealth production, distribution, and consumption. A key to accelerate changes lies in establishing bridges between sectorial big data and between data and content. And so to foster real-time learning, we created this webinar series, which is a joint effort between uh, the Center for Convergence of Health and Economics at McGill University, the Johns Hopkins Global VC Prevention Center, and uh, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center at Carnegie Mellon University. And we bring in a number of speakers <coughs> to talk about, uh, about health, marketing, markets, technology, and, uh, and big data. So we're really happy that you could all uh, join us today. I just wanted to let you know that we will be having another <laughs> webinar uh, that we haven't scheduled uh, uh, the date yet. We'll be sending out notices. It'll be Atula uh, Ginge. Ginge. Uh, we'll be giving a webinar. We'll be sending out notices for that. So I'm going to turn the mic over to, oh, uh, my name's Sean Brown. I'm the Director of Public Health Applications at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. And I'm going to turn the mic over to my colleague, Lorette Dubé. Thank you, Sean. I'm Laurette Dubé, the founding chair and scientific director of the uh, McGill Center for the Convergence of Health and Economics, and I'm also a chair professor at the Des Hotel uh, Faculty of Management in Consumer and Lifestyle Psychology and Marketing. Um, I am extremely pleased to introduce you today, David Barkridge, who has been a very close collaborator and pioneer in forcing uh, the science and the data uh, to go more deeply on, on understanding the interface between what we do on the health and on the commercial side, what we do on the agriculture, the food, and the, uh, the health and healthcare. Uh, so this is without uh, further uh, comments that uh, I'd like to introduce David himself um, and then uh, his talk today. Uh, David is an associate professor of epidemiology and biostatistics here in Montreal, uh, where he holds the Canadian Institute of Health Research Chair in He Health Intervention. He's also a medical cons consultant to the Montreal Public Health Department and the Quebec Public Health Institute. Uh, David has consulted on surveillance in organizations such as the Public Health Agency of Canada, the U.S. Institute of Medicine, the U U.S. and Chinese Center for Disease Control, as well as in Europe and at the level of the uh, WHO. Uh, David Old, an MD from Queen's University, an MSc from University of Toronto, and a PhD in Biomedical uh, Informatics from Stanford University. Uh, he is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, of Canada with specialty in public health and uh, preventive medicine. Uh, what he will be talking about today using big data and, in, and artificial intelligence for population health is a combination of its very uh, important and influential um, population health uh, work in bringing AI and big data for decision support on the health side, but also uh, work on um, taking food as the domains. How do we uh, bring that same approach to better understand and hopefully influence food and other sectors that contribute to health? So David, uh, welcome. Thank you, Lorette, uh, for that very kind introduction, and, and thank you, Sean. So I'll uh, proceed then with my talk, and uh, I've tried to um, uh, see here. Sorry, just things moving. There we go. Organize the talk into three sections. First of all, the context and to, uh, that we're working in right now. The second, to focus on some of the work we're doing, which I think illustrates more the big data aspects, and then the third piece, uh, which illustrates more the work that we're doing. I would say more from an artificial intelligence uh, perspective. So first of all, starting uh, with the context, we're in a world, as I think everybody acknowledges, where we have uh, much data. And certainly from a health perspective, and this is just really showing a health lens on, on that 
on, on the amount of data that's available to us now. And this is a, a, a figure taken from a publication in the Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, where um, where the authors uh, attempted just to lay out in terms of the rows going down before you, the types of data, and then going across to the right, they've tried to structure this in terms of structured and unstructured data, so coded and, and uncoded. Uh, and then just showing you all the different sources we have, and, and often we operate in one small part of this environment where we're analyzing data. But clearly one of the great sort of opportunities uh, that we see from, from big data in terms of certainly the variety aspect of big data is the capacity to link across some of these multiple sources of data and really learn more about what drives behavior and where interventions may have the most effect. But the challenge really is, I think, uh, in many settings now, how do we pull this data together and how do we make use of it? And, and I think that, that demand or that need to kind of link together, integrate that data is even more compelling when we think specifically about chronic diseases. And so what you're seeing now is a, is a, is a figure from the Foresight uh, Project in the United Kingdom when they looked at obesity. And that's just one example of where they tried to lay out some of the intricate relationships uh, between very different sectors, if you will, or aspects about what's really driving or causing uh, obesity and, and leading to this uh, uh, growth in obesity that we're seeing worldwide. And what this really illustrates uh, for one condition, but I think it's true for all chronic diseases, is that they really have quite complex causality. And if we think about that in relation to the data view we just saw on the page before, what that means is that we want to analyze, even from an observational perspective, what's going on with obesity or other complex chronic diseases. And especially if we want to think about successful interventions, we're going to have to link across those data. And, and moreover, we're probably going to have to have longitudinal data because these conditions develop over considerable time and it may take time for interventions as well to have an effect. And whatever we do from all of this, when we're doing analyses, uh, if we're trying to drive action, we have to produce information or outputs that, that can be presented in an interpretable manner so that people really do know where uh, to take action, what levers to pull, if you will, within this complex system. And so the challenge is, uh, that's the challenge, and what's the status? Well, this is a quote from an Institute of Medicine, now called National Academy of Science, uh, report in 2010 looking at the how well we're doing in terms of organizing population health information to drive action uh, and have accountability. And the, 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 as you can see, the conclusion was that we're not doing a terribly good job of organizing, structuring that information and, and driving uh, inference from it. And that's really where, where the work that, that my research group is focused on is trying to do. What, can, we, can we do a better job of creating that, that portrait, if you will, um, and, and really bringing together information? Uh, and evidence. And in fact, the way we, we, we frame that work is in the context of evidence-based population health, which, which really says that you know, we're, we're living in this environmental and organizational context, and if we want to change population health, we have to bring things together in an in in a intelligent way, if you will. First, resources about that, that might exist within the broader public health system, people that are looking at population health and, and trying to take activities or take action story, we need to have people who are skilled and have the capacity. We also need evidence, and I'll come back to this in a second, but by this I mean knowledge about, you know, different aspects of what's driving what and, and what actions we can take, how likely are they to be effective, and then we need information about the populations that we're concerned about. Uh, and so that includes information about individual characteristics, needs, values, but obviously has to be taken from a population perspective. So, you know, you need to be able to some sense segment the population, if you will, into different subgroups uh, that we're most likely to have a meaningful effect on depending on what their needs are and what kind of evidence of, of, of interventions are available to us. And so this is the frame that, that I want you to keep in the back of your mind as you go through the examples for the rest of the talk. And, and as I said, um, when we think about evidence, it's also useful to think about what kind of evidence or knowledge do we really need to have to make a difference in population health. And this is uh, one model of, of how evidence can be thought about. One is that we have this, what's called type one, or that, that column in the left. We're really thinking about evidence or knowledge of what, what at some fundamental level is driving what. So causal knowledge, if you will. Smoking causes lung cancer, the example here. And the second type of evidence is this evidence of, well, okay, we know smoking causes lung cancer, but what evidence is there that we can do something about that? So this is often when we think about interventions and we think about randomized trials or cluster randomized trials. 
How do we know that, for example, that if we, in this example, if we price, if we increase the price in the targeted media campaign, that will reduce smoking rates? And then the third type of evidence is really that what often comes from inter, uh, implementation science. You know, how do we really get and make those those things that we know in theory should work to change something? How do we really make them work in some given place? And so there are these different types of evidence that I'll, I'll talk about to some extent uh, in the rest of the talk, but you can keep this in mind as well. So that's the context. Just to summarize, we've got a lot of data that is quite heterogeneous, but all relevant to what we're talking about here in population health. We have these very complex diseases like obesity and diabetes that are growing at a rapid rate around the world, but there's no clear, simple solution. And we currently lack some way to really make sense, if you will, of a lot of that data and understand uh, how to move forward and, and can convey that to decision makers in a meaningful way. And so now I'm going to talk about two kind of angles on the work that we're doing to address that problem. The first is kind of a big data uh, perspective. And this is really about trying to use big data that exists to understand uh, better what foods people are purchasing. And I'll explain why I think that's a really important focus. And that's work that uh, we're doing with a number of people. I'll just quickly acknowledge uh, the first two people mentioned here, Hiroshi and Deepa, are PhD students. Uh, Yuma is a, is a faculty member here at McGill, and Lorette Dubé, who you already heard with, we work quite closely in this regard, uh, along with some others, but I just want to highlight those folks. So just to begin with, why are we, uh, you know, to frame why we're looking at this issue of, of, of what food people purchase. Um, this disability adjusted life years is a commonly used metric uh, to try and put a number of different conditions or diseases as well as risk factors on a similar scale. And the idea is if you look at the bar at the bottom, if you think about a person's life course that goes from the left to the right, um, your expected life uh, course or expectancy of life would be right from the very left to the very right. We can see expected life years. And of course, if you die early, you will lose some years of life, and that's called years of life loss. But also for the portion that you're living, what's shown on this bar is gray that you're in perfect health, and orange is that you have some disease or disability. And so in addition to dying early and, and losing some years of life, you could also imagine living when you're in not perfect health, so somewhere between zero and one. And what disability adjusted life years is, is a metric that tries to roll up that some measure of disability with that years of life loss so you can look at diseases and risk factors on common footings. When we do that, it may not surprise you, or it may surprise you to find out that in Canada at least, and this is similar for most developed countries, the vast majority of disability adjusted life years, this was in 2010, and I think this is a trend that's only becoming more pronounced, but the vast majority, in this case 87% of disability adjusted life years are attributable to non-communicable diseases. So the kinds of complex chronic diseases I was talking about uh, when I gave the example of obesity. Of course, if we look a little more deeply, this breaks down to a number of different uh, clusters of types of chronic diseases, but that's really what's, what's driving our disability uh, and um, disability and early death uh, in Canada and other developed countries. And it's increasingly the same, I would say, as well for developing countries. And if we ask ourselves, what can we do about that? Well, the number one risk factor uh, for loss of all disability adjusted life years, according to this analysis from the Global Burden Disease Study, is dietary risk. And so this leads us to an important question as to, well, what do we really know about what people are eating um, and how that's affecting their health? Well, in terms of what people are eating, we currently don't do a very good job of measuring that right now from, uh, from a population health perspective. We generally run surveys, which are fairly expensive to run, um, and so they, they don't come in with um, accurate measure, measures for us very frequently, and they're usually at a very low geographical resolution. So we thought, what, what can we do that will give us a better look at, at, at what people are actually Oh, it appears we have lost David's audio. <laughs> so we'll give him a minute to come back in. <laughs> Uh, David, if you can hear me, we've, we've, we've lost your audio. Yeah, obviously, he hasn't noticed.
Unfortunately, I have no other way of telling him since he can't hear me. Or no, make him not essential. Perhaps. That might catch his attention. I apologize, everyone. We're we're working to get uh, uh, Dr. Buckridge's uh, Dr. Buckridge's audio back, so please be patient. Okay. Loren, right, if you have his phone number, maybe you would like to call him and let him know that he's no longer. I I turned off the presentation. Can we apologize, everybody? We've lost the uh, audio from our uh, – ah, there we go. Hi, John. I don't know what happened. I just got kicked off there. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm giving you back presenter so you can just pick up – you can reshare your screen and pick up where you left off. I figured turning off presenter might get your attention. <laughs> what, uh, what, what slide did you lose me at? Uh, one before that you were currently on. You had just changed when I turned off the presentation. It was one with the four blocks. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. I don't know what happened. I just got uh, ejected from the call. Um, yep, that the yep, that's the one. Okay, hold on a sec. Okay. Great. Okay. We're back and rolling. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Appreciate that. Uh, okay. So as I was saying, um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity in these data. So they're, you know, most foods are scanned. Those, those data that are, are captured then within each individual store are centralized in different ways, and we can figure out what essentially the nutritional value of each of those things is. And if you're interested, you can also try and come up with some sort of more global measure of healthiness. So what we did for our, our research activities is we, we purchased uh, some of these data uh, from the Nielsen Corporation with their store scan data, which uh, gave us six year, for six years uh, in the province of Quebec, which is about 8 million people. And so this was a, a sample of, of a number of different stores, uh, as you can see there. And the, the data that came from, from the store scan you're seeing in the bottom table. And so that gave us, it was quite, quite disaggregated, which allowed us to do m many interesting analyses I'll show in a second. Uh, at bench at the week level, by store, by specific item. And so we get the price, the item units, and so on. Uh, and what we also did is we spent a fair bit of time building up the full marketing frame by, by linking together a number of different business registries, which you see on the top, to try and understand the, the full frame. We could not link the Nielsen data for obvious reasons to specific individual stores, but this at least would give us an individual a sense of you know, what proportion of the full picture uh, are we seeing. Uh, and so I'll talk first about some, some analyses that we've done to look at vegetables. This is work led by, by Deepa, who I mentioned earlier. And so what, one of the things that she did was she took uh, all the pricing data on vegetables, creating a common basket, if you will, of, of vegetables. And she did the same thing for fruits, but I'll just look at vegetables here, uh, that are purchased within a given region in Quebec. And so what you're seeing here over the six years of data is the price within each of those regions. So the, the thicker line is showing you a slightly smooth moving average over the, the actual data that you see in the background. But what you can see is there's a fair bit of uh, heterogeneity, both in absolute price and in variation. 
Uh, and so what, uh, what we started to do is try to, to pull apart or tease apart some of what's driving that, that variation. Uh, and so if you, in fact, try and, uh, using time series methods, pull out the overall time trend, you can see, in fact, that we do see over the course of our data uh, an increase, the linear trend, or not linear actually, but a trend in terms of the price of vegetables increasing over time. Uh, and we can actually look and see how, how that looks within regions if we actually at a regional level with every region time series pull up the time trends. You can see a similar picture where most of them are, are curving up. And, and we're still continuing this analysis, but what we can now do, of course, is see to what extent we have some regions that might be trending differently than others. And we can do the same thing for seasonal patterns. So here we see a quite clear uh, seasonal fluctuation in the price of vegetables. Uh, which you can think of obvious reasons as to what's driving this. This is not, not really rocket science to see that there's this overall trend. But what we think is particularly interesting is how is that trend um, vary across subregions? So are there some regions that are much more influenced by this seasonal pattern or by that temporal trend? And in fact, the, the next step now, of course, is to look at how this intersects with affordability in the sense of how does um, the available income within each of these regions relate to these fluctuations that we're seeing. And so this allows us to potentially understand the influence of how these price fluctuations affect people's actual purchasing and ultimately we would assume consumption uh, of fruits and vegetables and can lead us towards, I think, a much deeper understanding of uh, you know, what's driving that process and start to identify possibly some, some in interventions that may have effects at the population scale. So that's one uh, particular angle we've taken looking at uh, sort of you know, healthier examples of what, what foods are purchased uh, and, and, and eaten using these data. But we've also uh, done some, fair, some work looking at some of the unhealthier foods that people are purchasing uh, and carbonated uh, sugary soft drinks are one example. And this is the work that's being led by uh, Hiroshi, who I mentioned earlier. So one thing that uh, we can do there is look at what's the overall relationship between sales and price promotion, looking across all of the data that we have for these uh, carbonated sugary soft drinks. And it may not surprise you to see a fairly tight relationship between changes in, in price and changes in purchasing. So obviously there are some, some clear linkages here. And one of the things we tried to dig into is, well, what's the spatial variation in, in pricing? And in fact, maybe perhaps even price discounting of some of these sugary soft drinks. And how does that relate, as well as overall purchasing, with spatial variation we may see in other uh, factors, such as the income we would see, or the median income in that region. And so this is one of the very first analyses we did uh, a few years ago, where we looked at the total, this is the island of Montreal you're looking at, uh, by the way, which is the, uh, about a population of approximately 2 million people on the island, uh, largest, uh, third largest, uh, second largest city actually, I think, in Canada. Um, and so what you're seeing on the left here is the overall, um, the log predicted carbonate soft drink sales total in uh, that region in 2010. And on the right, what you're seeing is the median personal income. And so if you're trying to look and see if there's any relationship, it's of course easy to look at in a scatter plot. And here you can see a fairly uh, strong negative correlation suggesting that areas with lower mean income are generally purchasing higher amounts of uh, sugary soft drinks. And in fact, we've gone on to look at that in a little more detail. And this is an example from some of the work that, that Hiroshi has been doing looking at um, price promotion specifically. So if you think about the price uh, of a um, carbonated soft drink, it, it has a flat price that may change over time uh, and in sort of a long, long time frame, but there are also uh, shocks or fluctuations in prices at a very higher frequency due to discounts or, or sales, basically, that may be offered. And so what we want to look at is to see, well, first of all, are those sales or discounts, is there any differential uh, occurrence of that by socioeconomic status? So we want to basically see if retailers or, or, um, or manufacturers are lowering their price considerably uh, more in lower income, for example, than higher income areas. And we look at this stratified by different types of outlets you see here, supermarkets and convenience stores. Uh, and we're looking, in fact, here showing you the regular price difference and the price promotion. And what you're seeing on the top is, of course, that there really is no pattern in price promotion. So there's no preferential uh, discounting, if you will in lower socioeconomic uh, income areas. However, what we did notice is that there is some differential um, uptake, if you will, of that discounting. So even though the exposure is uniform by uh, SES, in this case we're looking, I believe, at education, but we looked at income as well, 
what we do see is a much greater pickup of that discounting in some types of stores. So here we're showing primarily pharmacies and match mass merchandisers. Uh, there seems to be when there is a, a sale or a price discount in, a, in an area with a lower level of average education, the relative increase in terms of how much more is bought is much higher. Whereas we did not see a similar pattern in supermarkets and convenience stores. And so I think this is a very interesting finding and one that has implications for uh, many things, including taxation policy, because uh, think of the taxation, it's really affecting that longer term price run. And what we're seeing here is that variations uh, in promotion uh, on a higher frequency could in fact negate some of those effects you're, you're possibly having uh, in the long run with taxation. So that's one, one piece. And then the next thing we're trying to look at uh, now is, well, we have that, that idea more from a store level, but can we somehow now use the store level to come up with a better population level inference? And so as I mentioned, we tried to get the sampling frame for these stores as well. And so what we did then was try to say, can we now forecast out the entire frame from the observed uh, values that we have in our, in our data? And so as you can see, that's this kind of could be seen as either a prediction or an imputation problem. But essentially, we have uh, data in our sample. Uh, and for those stores, we have information on their size, location, the chain, the store types, those sort of things, uh, as well as the sales and promotion data that we could care about. And then from our business registry, we actually have all, a lot of other information on the rest of the, of the um, frame, if you will. And so this gives us an, an opportunity to try and, and, and predict out and then come up with a, a more, if you will, complete estimate of uh, not only what, where these stores are, but what's actually being sold from these stores. And so this just shows you sort of some early work towards this where we did some very simple smoothing around the stores, but uh, the next step here is to move on to more sophisticated uh, spatial modeling, which is in fact what, uh, what we're doing right now. Those results are not quite ready to show, but, but uh, we're essentially going from these essentially store level data to estimates that, that can be looked at it more from a population perspective. So that's, in terms of ongoing work we're doing in this area, just to, uh, to, to look at the, the, the steps, the next steps in the future for us. Uh, as I mentioned, the first piece is that we really want to get now into much more of the effect of not just store, but also area level purchasing uh, data and understand how that influences individual level health risk factors and outcomes. And so we have a number of strategies that we're, we're considering for looking at that. But I'll say just a bit more about the last two pieces here, the, the building predictive models on food purchasing uh, and also the linking purchasing and health data. So this second point here, uh, we're actually involved in a partnership right now with the Metro Corporation, as I mentioned earlier, which is a large grocery retailer here in the province of Quebec. And the map shows uh, for the province of Quebec, all their stores are shown in the large map there on, in, in purple. And the, uh, the agreement we have with them is that within the greater Toronto, uh, or sorry, greater Montreal region, which you see in orange in the inset map, uh, they'll be providing to us data on all of the retail transactions in those stores. And that's about 100 stores. Um, uh, as well as, interestingly as well, um, the anonymized uh, data on the, um, the loyalty card holders. So the people that have loyalty, card hold, um, loyalty cards, when they purchase food from the store, of course, their card gets scanned and linked to their purchase record. And so that adds a, another level of, of, of interest, if you will, for us in the data compared to the Nielsen data, which were at the store level, but had no individual linkage. Here now, we can, for people that when they use these loyalty cards, we can't link necessarily to individuals, but certainly to households over time, what kind of purchases are being made. And we also have information on what kinds of incentives uh, are being provided to those people, both in terms of uh, coupons and other sort of uh, uh, information that may incentivize them to buy different types of products. And so that uh, ultimately right now we're really in the process of working out some of the, uh, the data structure details with them that are very close to um, having that data set which will allow us to perform <clears throat> pardon me, a series of, of analyses to, to sort of further our understanding about what's driving a healthy and unhealthy purchasing. And in fact, the first thing that we'll look at uh, in collaboration with, the, with Metro is they've put in place a campaign where they've, they've, they've tried to indicate within a product category which items are, are healthier using different sort of uh, types of, of logos and we'll see to what extent that's been effective. Further down the road, <clears throat> what we're, 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 we're really quite excited about is, is actually digging deeper into these kinds of data that, that we can access from Metro to really understand 
what are some of the behavioral drivers in terms of what is driving people to buy healthier or unhealthier foods, ultimately then to design interventions that might, uh, obviously with the consent and engagement of those consumers, help them to achieve healthier um, you know, purchasing patterns and, 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 and dining patterns. So we think this is really exciting because this brings in all sorts of interesting uh, analytic challenges. Uh, both in terms of thinking of this as, as sort of a, a, both an AI methods as well as a number of different uh, methods could be applied here to really understand uh, what, you know, over time within this system, how individuals are influenced uh, by kind of current marketing methods and what other kinds of marketing methods might be used to drive them in a, in a healthier direction that would still be something that would be, from a retailer's perspective, uh, an interesting and positive thing to do. And so I know there's probably been a lot of talk in previous webinars on this issue of convergence. And so this is sort of thinking about this idea of, you know, how can we really, at a, at a sort of personalized way with individuals, both drive them in a healthier direction, but engage retailers to do it in a way that, that they're active and, and, and positive participants in that. So to summarize then, in terms of the sort of the, the big, big data work we've been doing around food, um, it's obvious, I think, to most people, a healthy diet is a really important determinant of population health, but we, we currently really don't have much uh, data on that from usual sources. And these kinds of transactional data that can come out of a purchasing activity, I think, offer a really novel perspective from a, from a population perspective on what's going on, but also an opportunity to really try and engage with individuals uh, and hopefully modify their behaviors. So, and I should mention we've had uh, good funding for this from uh, both the Canadian Foundation for Innovation and the Public Health Agency of Canada, and we have uh, the practice partners I've, I've noticed, noted there. So now I'll move on to the last part of the talk around some work uh, that we're doing that I think illustrates a bit more the artificial intelligence aspect uh, of, uh, of pop population health, if you will. Uh, and so this uh, number of people are working uh, closely with us, and this lists uh, some of the team here. Um, and most of this work has been embodied within a, um, a software platform we've been building over the last five years called the Population Health Record. Um, a population health record is something that's a concept that we did not define ourselves. It's been around for a while. The idea is it's analogous to an electronic medical record, which if you can think about is kind of an integrator of information for a clinician. It pulls together all sorts of different information about a patient and present it to them in a hopefully an intelligent way that allows them to make better decisions about health management. And so the population health record is exactly that, but for a defined population. So you want to pull together all the pieces of all the data sets. And so if you think you go back to one of the very first slides when we talked about all the different data, how can we pull in those the relevant different data and convert that into useful information around a specific defined population to help people make better decisions as to how to manage population health. And, and, and this is exactly what the concept of the population health uh, uh, record is all about. And so here's a bit of a schema or a cartoon, if you will, of, of the system that we've built. If you look at the bottom, what we do is we start with data on that defined population. We want to get essentially a, a cohort of data coming out of uh, medical claims uh, records. Uh, and also we have the capacity, although we've not yet linked in clinical data repositories, but if these data are linked at the individual level, it allows us to compute uh, on a large population scale, essentially all sorts of metrics of chronic disease occurrence and complications down the road. And then if you look at the left side, what you can see is we have a number of different data sources, including any indicators you might compute from the uh, marketing data I just talked about around food purchasing. And those metrics are, are going to be available. These are basically about risk factors, things or determinants of health, if you will. And we're only able to compute those geographically. We usually can't link those to individuals, but we can push them down to a fairly high geographic resolution and compute them over time. And so that then does provide, I think, a fairly good sense of, of what's driving those outcomes. And then behind all this, we have a formal representation, which I'll get into a little bit more, uh, about how conceptually all of the features or indicators you can derive from these data relate to one another. Uh, and then ultimately, we want to make uh, indicators that we compute out of these available to, to different types of users. We focus, for the most part so far, on, on public health users. And the real two innovations that we're bringing here, in addition to being one of the first groups, I think, to really implement this concept as a, as a software platform, is to have some of this real-time data capacity 
certainly more along the bottom. We're, we're creating essentially a pipeline where as these data continue to come in, we can automatically update these metrics. And so it becomes a way for people to really derive value from these large administrative data sets in an ongoing way without having to have a lot of manual steps, which, which often slow the movement of information from these sources into decision maker hands, leading to delays of years sometimes, which is not so helpful when you're trying to actually make decisions on the ground. And the second piece, as I mentioned, is that we use this formal representation of knowledge, uh, a representative of something called an ontology within the system, to pull together this information and present it to people in a meaningful way. And I'll come back to how we do that uh, in a second. So, so first of all, we've implemented this system uh, currently for the greater region of Montreal, which I, I'd shown you before. And, and the island is the part in the center, as I mentioned, is about 2 million, but the larger region is almost 4 million people. And so we, we took, first of all, a 25% random sample of, of the entire population of this region in 1998. Uh, and then we basically continued to sample the data, claims data and health data for these people every year over time until they, until they essentially leave the area or die. And every year we replace data for those that, um, that leave or die by resampling new people who are born or immigrate to the region. So we're always maintaining this representative sample. However, I should mention, this is really what we've done for demonstration, but uh, this, this, this process obviously could, could scale to, to all data for all people in a region, and you would not have any sort of sampling concerns. One of the big issues, as I mentioned, is how do you organize or arrange this information? And so uh, we, we've thought about, we're, we're, we've tried to uh, adopt in our system uh, different uh, frameworks for calculating indicators. Uh, and one we're using is this one around chronic diseases from the, the um, um, Public Health Agency of Canada, but because of the way that we're representing these indicators within, our, within an ontology or a, a fairly flexible knowledge representation, we could easily include different taxonomies or frameworks if people want to see indicators grouped or, or, or structured different ways. But really what's behind all the way that we're linking together all this information, as I mentioned, is, is a determinants of health framework, um, which really shows in a broader sense what is driving what in terms of population health. And this is one of the sort of earliest models that, that came out, but it's, it's a very kind of conceptual model, if you will, but it's not really something that we can compute over. So what we've tried to do is go to something that's a little more, a little more precise, if you will, and here's, a, here's just a, a conceptual graph, so this is still fairly, uh, I would say, loose in terms of its formality. But what we're showing here is that the concepts of interest to us are represented here as ovals, body mass index, for example, diabetes, and so on. And we're showing the, the relation between these as causal relationships, uh, as black arcs, and these are directed relationships. And, and you can quibble with how we've laid out this, 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 this causal network, but, or this in really causal, not, not formal causal graph, but this conceptual model of causality. And I'll get to something a bit more formal in a second, but the idea really is to have this framework of, of what's driving things that we can then hang the individual indicators on, which are, are shown as these blue boxes. And so this, this knowledge graph then becomes a way for us to organize and present information to people, not just in a way to make it easily, easier to access, but also in a way to help them understand what's, what's driving what. And, and the next step to go from this conceptual graph to something more formal is to create an actual ontology, which is really um, at, at, at the sort of simplest level, you can think of a taxonomy where you classify things into a hierarchy. So for example, we know that diabetes is a type of a chronic disease, so that would be a hierarchical relationship. And ontologies are very, very good at, at representing those relationships in a formal sense, but they can also represent other types of associations that are not hierarchical, things like a part of relationships. So a finger is a part of a hand, for example, or as I talked about before, they can represent causal knowledge. So we can actually have causal relationships suggesting that one thing is actually causing or can cause another thing. And so that is in fact what we've, 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 we've developed within our system is we've actually created a, um, a public health ontology and then we've actually linked in this causal information working with experts that we have built into this system a, a consensus knowledge about what is driving what and we can use that to better uh, integrate and examine the information we have. And so just to sort of bring that back to that, that example I showed you uh, at the start about types of knowledge, if you, in fact, we go back one, most systems that give you information about population health right now give you a, a laundry list of indicators, which you might think of as these blue, uh, blue boxes here. 
And so what we've done right now with our system already is with this causal knowledge within the system, we can now in fact link those indicators together to show, or, uh, or the concepts or the indicators behind them, what we expect to be driving what in the population. As I'll talk about more in a little bit in a second, we're also now working very hard on incorporating type two, type, type two evidence or knowledge into the system, which is essentially effectiveness of interventions. And if you can imagine, an intervention in public or population health is targeting one of those, those factors, those concepts. And so you can explicitly link an intervention to one of the concepts that you're trying to modify because Usually, public or population health interventions are addressing modifiable risk factors like diet, for example, or smoking. Uh, and the third part, or third type of knowledge, we're not actually going after right now actively, but if you could imagine if such a system was in place and being used in different, uh, by different public health jurisdictions, if they were to actually record in the context of this system which interventions they actually use, you would actually start to build a repository of what interventions are being done where, and that would be directly linked to the outcomes data, and you would essentially have the capacity to have what's, what you could think of as a learning public health system in that context. So just to show you what this looks like within our application, here's a screenshot of, uh, of how the knowledge graph looks when somebody's looking at type 2 diabetes. And so we, <clears throat> in fact, show that concept in the center, and this is a very simplified graph right now. We, in fact, have, have o we're only showing people the direct links from concepts that are upstream on the left, downstream on the right. You can expand this graph if you want and look at it, and it becomes obviously quite hairy if you look at the, the great complexity of all. You get almost to that foresight graph we showed before. But what this is really narrowing it down to is if you're interested in type 2 diabetes, here are the drivers on the left, here are what we think are the outcomes on the right. And what, I'm sh what we're showing with a different grayscale on these, these concepts on the left or the right are which of these concepts do we actually have information about. And for the central concept, the type 2 diabetes mellitus, we show, in fact, the indicators that are available in that box you see on the left. And in fact, right now, the one that's highlighted is prevalence. And so we can use this knowledge. So right now, this is no data. there's no data here. This is just knowledge about what drives what and consensus knowledge. But if we have a defined population, we can now, by clicking on that data link button you see in the top left, we can now show for the population that they've, they've already set, which you can't see that's done in a previous step for which population they're looking at, we can now compute what's the relationship between default indicators. So for example, what we're seeing is that, and this is at one geographic level, so this is an ecologic analysis at this point, but we can see there's a fairly strong negative relationship between income and type 2 diabetes, as we would expect. So we see much higher prevalence of diabetes, in lower income regions. And then we can also see that we have a fairly high positive correlation between type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and, and so on. Now, this is a fairly simple bivariate correlation, but as I'll talk about in a second, this becomes, I think, quite a powerful framework for knowledge to be used to really drive uh, on a very large scale um, analysis of, of the relationships between the information, uh, the indicators that we're calculating here. And of course, this system also allows you to do other things uh, you know, digging into uh, spatial data and into temporal variations across regions, uh, showing as well, for example, time series. And so I won't, I won't get into all this, but currently what we're doing right now with this system is we're in, in two large-scale uh, implementations. The one with the public health agency here in Quebec is, the, is at the most advanced stage, where we've actually implemented our software and hardware within their computing environment and we will be connecting to data for the entire province of Quebec, so that's 8 million people, and we'll be calculating uh, all those indicators for that population, and then we'll be making this system available to different people uh, in public and population health settings throughout the province of Quebec, and evaluating the impact of having access to different types of information presented in different ways on the kinds of uh, decisions and actions that they have to take around population health. We're also doing similar work with uh, the health services people here in Quebec, to, to see to what extent the system can also uh, support better decisions around health system management. So um, the last part of the talk here, then I'll just quickly say what are the, sort of the next steps we're doing here in terms of uh, our ongoing research we're doing around this, this, this population health record. Um, <clears throat> one thing we're doing is, is usability testing. So we've, we've actually uh, done a fair bit of work now on um, trying to really get users in front of this system refine uh, the, uh, the, the whole interface and how people are interacting with it because we realize if we really want to have this as a testing platform on a large scale, it has to be adopted and it has to be usable. Uh, and so as I'm just showing here as an example, we've done a number of these task-focused evaluations where we've created a series of defined 
tasks that we expect people to be able to do with the system. We first did this with, uh, with 10 uh, uh, master public health students and had fairly strong results. There's a publication coming out soon about that. Um, and then we've more recently done this with, with 20 public health practitioners who really are the target users. And we're seeing very high completion rates on the tasks and very high system usability scale results, which are, is just a metric out of 100 for how usable your system is. And anything over, over 70 is considered to be a, a good system. So we're, we're fairly happy with that going. And in fact, and we're also now moving into a redesign of, of, of the interface to respond to this feedback, which will allow us to incorporate um, some of that evidence I mentioned as well as uh, other things. So as I said, one of the big pieces we want to add to this system is, is to make it not just a system that can tell you what's going on right now, but also a system that can help you find out what is the, the best thing to do right now, if you will, to improve pop, uh, population health or to move a certain indicator in a certain direction. And so we're collaborating with, uh, with a group at, at, at McMaster University that actually creates these large knowledge bases in the biomedical literature and also with collaboration with Northeastern to see if we can't come up with a more automated process going from the biomedical literature, pulling out public health interventions, and then pulling those into a, a knowledge base of interventions and linking them into our system. This will allow us to then make available to people when they're looking at that information display around population health for a region to see not only what the current status is, but to see what the evidence is. And if you go right back to that evidence-based public health framework I talked about at the start, this is really where we want to bring together the evidence and the information right at the same place in a meaningful way for decision makers. And then the last thing really that I'll, I'll talk about is, 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 which I've already alluded to, is that we're also looking now at scaling up our population health analytics. So we've done a lot of work to create this infrastructure to bring together a lot of data, extract a lot of features from those data. And, and we have, in addition, as I mentioned, this, this knowledge skeleton, if you will, around it. And so we think that that knowledge framework is going to be a really great way to drive at scale large analysis, for example, using that as a prior of a Bayesian network structure that we can then start to really see does the data support that moving beyond those bivariate correlations I showed you before. And we think there's room there both to validate our knowledge structure as well as to identify unexpected patterns that we can feed back to users uh, and give them really interesting insights into beyond just what they can see, what we can analyze that, that, that seems to be driving changes in some regions and not others, for example. So to summarize uh, the AI piece, um, you know, population health decision makers clearly need uh, some support in, in making sense of all that vast amount of data and evidence and where to go with it. And uh, what we've done here is, is look at principally first this, this, this approach of knowledge modeling in terms of AI methods, but also increasingly also looking at other types of quantitative methods for how we can really bring together that information and facilitate decision making and bring in that evidence, which I think is, is really critical. So not really have these two worlds where we have a lot of great information analysis, but then ultimately somebody's got to go over to PubMed and, and figure out what to do about it. We want to really try and bring that into one framework. Um, and I should acknowledge our, our, our many uh, collaborators and funders uh, for this work. And uh, there are some publications and there are others I can make available if folks are interested. And, um, that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you very much for listening, and I apologize for the glitch earlier. Uh, no, no worries. Thank you, David. As expected, that was a wonderful talk, and uh, I will. Um, I'm going to introduce my uh, public health software manager because I have to run to a call with the CDC. He is going. Uh, Jay DePass is going to handle the question and answer period. So, if anybody has any questions. Uh, you, I've, I've muted everybody because just to prevent background noise. So if you would like to ask a question uh, by uh, voice, you can just go ahead and un unmute. Also, if you are inter if you uh, would rather, you can also put questions in the uh, chat window. And um, I'm guessing we'll start the, the question and answer period with uh, Dr. Dubé. Um, thank you, David. Excellent presentation. Um, and there are two questions to, uh, that I would like to uh, ask you to start with. Uh, one is, um, in fact, three. Uh, at the individual level, where in moving toward uh, supporting individuals in their LT choices, whether it is uh, choice in supermarket or whether it is supporting uh, drug compliance and so on, uh, we see uh, for the individual the health behavior is one 
uh, or health motive is one among so many other considerations, whether it is pleasure, convenience, whatever. So when we talk about optimizing, uh, developing uh, individual support for optimizing decision making at the individual level toward health, how would you see going uh, uh, in terms of integrating all those other criteria within an, uh, an, uh, an approach that will move to optimization? Um, that's my first question. And the two other ones are a bit the same in the sense that um, I was very pleased to see that the pop HR now is starting to get into primary care. Um, and in your diagram about the social determinant, you get the health care on one and then you get, let's say, food and uh, uh, in the other aspects. So whether it is uh, for a food manufacturer or food retailer or whether it is for the health care system, uh, there also the population health is one among other criteria for decision making. So how would you see the development of your research uh, as well as uh, the taking up of it uh, to support more prevention sensitive healthcare design and management or, or medical practice for that matter? And the same question also uh, in terms of supporting um, economically viable uh, decision making also, whether it's for the supermarket uh, or for food manufacturer, it cannot just be optimizing the nutrition. So I'd like to hear your thoughts there, both at the individual level as well as the organizational and system level uh, in those uh, those other sectors that interface with population health. Okay, um, and, uh, thank you, Lorette. Um, so I think it, for me it's easiest to think about that at the individual level, which uh, again, that in that work, we're not really talking about the POP HR so much. We were, uh, in that context, I was talking about linking together, for example, um, mm -hmm. you know, food purchasing data that might be directly accessed from a, a loyalty card program with, say, for example, health data from electronic medical record. And uh, of course, in any time, anyway, if, if that was done in some way to help an individual optimize achieving their health goals, you would need to know what their health goals are. So they, there would have to be individual values uh, encoded in that in some way. And you could think about, you know, I can, algorithmically it'd be quite straight, not straightforward, but there are strategies that can, you know, try to find optimal outcomes or best decision story to optimize outcomes given those inputs. And presumably you could, you could factor in other inputs if you wanted. I, I think I, I have a harder time Clearly, uh, answering your last two, um, because I mean, there we're, we're sort of a bit more thinking about the pop HR part of the presentation. If I understand your questions clearly, what you're saying is that, or you're, what you're pointing out is that much of what's done to optimize or to influence pop population health uh, is really not just public health going in and taking an action. It's it's a multi-sectoral thing, and it often requires partners. And so, uh, you know, you you can't look at just from a health perspective. Um, and so I think, you know, I think part of that response to that is that, you know, yes, clearly what we're doing, you could bring in other perspectives. We have thought about bringing in economic indicators um, that would also show potentially, you know, what, what the current currently is going on from an economic perspective in, in different areas. We can think about also projections within this system, and we sort of thought about if different actions are taken, how would they influence what we would the expected influence uh, on some outcome, for example. Uh, and so you could imagine thinking about that in an economic perspective. But really, so far, what's been driving the design of the POP HR has, has, has been mainly for public health people and for them to really understand what's going on and to figure out where they want to go. However, what we've seen, and I think this goes to your point, is that in many of our uh, usability tests, the people that have talked to us about the values in such an application in an in inter intersectoral way. So how would they use this application when they're speaking with somebody from education or somebody from another area in, in, you know, in government or some other industry that they want to point out to them the importance of what they're doing on health. So, so I think it's a tool for that, but that's really, uh, and that's an area for the future, but not one that we've really tried to explicitly incorporate into the application right now. 
So maybe I will just push a bit this question because I don't want to monopolize the floor. Um, because uh, on the line of ontology, because currently the same way you make very compellingly the case that if we are to move toward AI and big data and all that application for supporting decision, we need to have a formal organization of knowledge. And when uh, we are uh, talking to our collaborator, whether it is in agriculture or whether it is in retailing or manufacturing, where well, you get uh, also decision support that are done there. How would you see advancing uh, the intersection of the various ontology that are out there so that your platform is about population health, other platforms are about agriculture and so on. How would you see the intersectoral development of ontology that will foster uh, this uh, actual modular decision support of uh, of embedding uh, health uh, within whatever other uh, criteria or decision or or, uh, or knowledge that are in the other sector. Uh, just your your thoughts there, and then I will. Let Sean's colleague uh, coming in and uh, uh, advancing the discussion with the uh, with the virtual floor, uh, David. Sure. Well, I mean, I mean, one of the sort of desirable features, really, of ontologies is that they're, in in theory, uh, sort of extensible, uh, and it, depending on how the different ontologies are designed, they can be you know, incorporated or linked with one another. So um, I would say that what an ontology forces you to do. And this is an ontology. Just, just for those who aren't familiar with this, it's really just a, it's a, it's a representation of concepts in a domain in a, in a, in a systematic way. Often, in fact, right now, now almost always using logic uh, is, is, the, is the principal way of representing that knowledge. And so, it's usually qualitative knowledge, but it, it really, it, it really is, it explicates the, the relationships between these concepts in a domain. But it can also look across multiple domains. And it's interpretable both by a human and a computer. That's really the, the, the most important point, I think, is that humans can look at these constructs of how the knowledge relates, and computers can process them uh, and use them effectively within systems like the one I just showed you. So, so to that point, Lorette, I think it's, it's, it's certainly possible to look at the, you know, the ontology that we have behind this, and if we want to extend it into other domains that would allow us to bring in data from other domains, to extend it in that way. Um, and it, it forces us, I guess, to also be explicit about those relationships. And so that, that's good and bad because, it, you know, sometimes it's challenging to come up with a consensus that everybody can agree with, but it also does force us all to get on the same page, um, which is, is useful. Thank you. Back to you, Jay. Okay. Thank you, Loretta. Uh, and thank you, David. So I, I have two questions from the uh, – from, from callers. Uh, first, Marie Spiker from Johns Hopkins. Uh, has asked, and, and Marie, I, I can um, unmute you. Uh, I'll do so now. Uh, but I'll go ahead and read your question from the chat window. Uh, when you're looking at correlations in population health data, how do you distinguish between a correlation that's surprising and worth pursuing and a correlation that's likely spurious? Great question. So, uh, I mean, we don't right now. We just show it to people. Uh, so, I didn't show you, but in our ontology, as I mentioned, the the, um, the ontology is is qualitative, uh, the way we've encoded it right now, as most ontologies are. So, we're we're, we're showing, we're, we, in addition to showing directed causal relationships, we also show direction. So, is it is does an increase in one tend to suggest an increase in another, or or vice versa? Uh, and so. It is possible. We do have that within our framework, certainly in terms of the, the direction of the association to determine if that's, if that's surprising or not. Uh, it would be also possible if we have prior knowledge of what the magnitude of the association is to also test that against what we see in the data. But, but what we're really thinking about is moving beyond bivariate correlation, which we understand is, is quite a limiting way. That was really just a sort of an initial stab, if you will. Um, we, we, we think the most sort of natural extension is, is to think about our, our, our causal graph as, as a, a Bayesian network, if you will, or, or a prior on the structure of Bayesian network, uh, which we could then actually do some degree of structural learning around that, that structure based on what we see from the data. Um, and we could also then, from that, infer some uh, you know, conditional probability distributions for all the nodes in the network. 
then, of course, we have the possibility to have a much more nuanced look at what the data suggests is going on versus what the knowledge suggests, and we could look, build into that framework some checks for things that are surprising. And, and this is exactly what we've heard from decision makers, in fact, is that, you know, yes, they know that the lower income areas have higher rates of obesity. That's not so surprising. You know, yes, they know in general obesity seems to be going up, and, you know, and they're fairly aware of general trends, but, you know, they want their attention brought to things that are surprising. And then, so that's where we think we have a, a potential here to add something with the analytics on top of those data. Yeah, that's, that's a great response. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, uh, so I have uh, uh, two questions from Pandu, um, whom I'm going to unmute uh, just now. And I'll go ahead and read the questions. Uh, the correlation between unhealthy food and income is interesting. Do you think there's a causal relation between them? And have you tried to find out which might be um, on the reason side and which might be on the result side? Uh, and then a, a second part uh, to the question was that the, uh, the knowledge graph structure that you demonstrated in your slides looks clear and beautiful. Uh, what kind of software are you using for building and visualizing the knowledge graph? Okay, uh, thanks, Ben. The first question um, is, is sort of a deeper question. Um, you know, so I guess you're asking is, do people, for example, who uh, have lower, who live in lower income regions, and can, don't forget the analysis I showed was ecologic. So what we're saying there is that regions that have lower median income tend to purchase more sugary carbonated soft drinks. So we always have to be a little careful in inferring individual, you know, individual level associations, those kind of ecologic associations, but. There certainly is evidence, not from what I've shown, but, you know, in the literature uh, that this relationship does also exist at the individual level, that, you know, lower, lower income individuals do tend to purchase and consume higher amounts of, of these products. So um, in terms of, you know, what's driving what, uh, in that situation it does seem like, you know, the lower income status is associated with or driving higher purchasing. but. Uh, uh, others can probably speak more more clearly to that that literature. For, for the second question, um, uh, we're actually uh, using this is a, a custom application that we've built over the last three years or four years with, with funding from the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. So it's a fairly substantial investment in terms of software development, but it's all using open source uh, software tools. So we're primarily using it's a client server uh, system, and we're using JavaScript on the client side including toolboxes like the D3 toolbox. So uh, the graph, though, is something that we've actually done a lot of custom work on because uh, none of the sort of out of the box, if you will, graph layout applications uh, have given us the kind of clarity and, and usability that we've liked. Um, so we, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that <laughs> I appreciate that comment because it's very hard to make it uh, uh, easy to use. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing uh, the the tools you are using. Thank you. My pleasure, Ben. So uh, I, I don't see any other questions in the chat window. Uh, but if anybody else uh, has a question for David, and I will have if there is other other not others, but I want to leave the chance to others uh, before. Uh, is there other question from the from the floor? You just have to unmute yourself. No? Okay. If you allow me, I will ask uh, a couple more that are very much building uh, on the, kind of the, uh, the series of questions and, and answers that have been uh, provided over uh, this uh, series. The first uh, webinar in the series uh, was um, uh, by uh, your, um, uh, at the supercomputing uh, center, I don't remember his name, but, um, uh, but uh, it was the question of, of how can we uh, use intelligence, artificial machine learning, and so on, 
uh, in a way that is as much informed by the existing knowledge that is out there uh, as well as by the empirical ongoing evidence that we accumulate. And I was very interested, uh, David, in your um, extension uh, when you were uh, in the pop HR session about seeing uh, knowledge-based machine learning. So could you talk a bit about how you are currently using machine learning, if you are, and how you are integrating uh, this uh, existing knowledge in uh, the machine learning use and what you would see as the next uh, uh, next uh, ne next uh, step there if we are to move per se within your pop HR, but I think it is also as we move really to in toward the intersectoral, uh, I think it is an important aspect we would need to think through. Well, so, so right now we're really at the planning stage and the pilot stage, I guess you might say, but I mean, I think this, this, this perspective that we're trying to take to this is that, um, you know, what we built essentially, you can think of it as a large repository of features uh, on a population. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're not the only people to have done this. There are other groups, uh, for example, um, uh, George Ripsack at Columbia University has built the, the Odyssey Project, which is, you know, links together uh, a large number, I think covering almost, uh, I forget how many million people now around the world, number of different, you know, health databases, uh, all coded according to a common knowledge model. And what he started to do uh, is to look at, you know, what are the kind of the pairwise relationships between diseases, drugs, diseases, and so on. Um, and, you know, and is doing it in a very data-driven way. And, and others are doing this with similar large health data repositories. But the challenge go becomes once you want to go beyond a simple bivariate relationship, you know, how do you control for all of the factors you know that are confounders and things like confounding by indication and so on, and so that you're not just, you know, deriving sort of you know, inference that's really not that that useful, if you will. Uh, and so this is where we think that, you know, the, the, the knowledge model that we have, which we've built, curated and built mainly from a manual perspective, but as I, I've said, could be, you know, its maintenance could be somewhat automated through an interface to the biomedical literature. Um, you know, so once you've got that kind of knowledge structure, you can, you can use that as a, as a constraint, if you will, or a frame for, for machine learning against the raw data so that, first of all, you're not necessarily operating on raw data. You can operate on features that have been already extracted from the raw data, and those could be indicators, uh, which can still be at the individual level. They don't necessarily need to be aggregated. Um, and then you can start to use that knowledge structure to define, you know, essentially model structures for machine learning and to also either, you know, constrain what you're learning or to flag, as, as one of the comments was made, what are unusual things. So if you're finding that you're seeing an unusual uh, fit with the data to some aspect of that knowledge model, that in itself is interesting. It suggests either that your knowledge model is wrong or there's something going on with the data that's, that's you know, inconsistent with, with the knowledge. So, so we're really at a planning stage there, but I, I think it, this is something where there are a number of groups around the world, not a large number, but a handful, that are in a similar position to us and are trying to understand how to really scale up that quantitative analysis by using knowledge to, you know, essentially frame that, that, that analytic pursuit, if you will, and to help identify what's a useful observation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, let me give an opportunity to a virtual floor question before I get to my last one. Anyone else wants to uh, ask question? No? Okay. Uh, my uh, my last question will uh, a bit come back on the uh, on the question uh, and comments that were related to the low socioeconomic status, well, what's, uh, what's part of it? We do know indeed that uh, low socioeconomic status uh, uh, do have all type of uh, uh, negative uh, outcome from a health perspective. Um, and we do know also that uh, it is an area where there is a lot of investment being made by various uh, sectors to try to help improving the context. Um, and when uh, you were talking, for instance, that the uh, soft drink, there may be more promotion and so on and so forth. And from, a pers from 
uh, a commercial perspective, I am a retailer, I have a portfolio of products that I want to uh, foster, and there is room for shifting the nutritional um, and uh, uh, nutritional and economic outcome of this portfolio. But there is also another type of synergy, which is to see to what extent at the intervention level can there be more of the bridge being made between the population health intervention, whether it is education, whether it is kind of wider aspects for targeting the same individual and the same population. And I think now that you are in the field with the, the uh, across Quebec, I believe, uh, with the population health uh, um, institute, what would you see both uh, in terms of the, the support that PopHR could provide, but also from an intervention perspective, where do you think we can go in targeting uh, the whole socioeconomic spectrum toward uh, this healthier food uh, and healthier diet portfolio by more synergy between the population health intervention and the intervention of all the other actors? And how would you see you're truly evolving in supporting more of this? Oh, yeah. Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the tool's a tool. Uh, there has to be a will to use it in a certain way. Uh, and so I think, you know, I, 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 do, I do believe the people in the formal public health sector very much realize that one of the most important, you know, a lot of their things they do, they're not just enacting things. They're, I mean, a lot of their work is around advocacy and partnerships and so on. Um, but, I mean, I think as you know quite well too, there's sort of a question of perspective, right, in terms of how people in the public health sector uh, who are responsible for interventions from that perspective, how they perceive and interact and engage with other sectors, including particularly people in, in, in the private sector and retail. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of work that has to happen into how do you get those people into the same Space, both physically and conceptually, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to, to, to you know want yeah. to be able to find those solutions. I think a tool like Pop HR can certainly be helpful in making explicit what are the relationships and drivers um, mm -hmm. that are moving population health and how you know the private sector plays a very important role in driving that. Um, and so I think you know, as I mentioned earlier, some of our, our decision makers in public health that have looked at this application have seen it's a lot of value in terms of that illustration and that, that the communication with other sectors. So I, I could see it playing a fairly important role there. I mean, the other piece that I didn't talk a lot about is we, we have also thought a fair bit, and it's a, another angle uh, that we plan to pursue, is to that, in fact, incorporate knowledge, for example, from attributable fractions. So, and that's a, a concept in epidemiology and public health that allows us to say, well, what proportion of some outcome is due to what exposure? Uh, and that becomes a very powerful tool for doing what if kind of scenarios. So you can say, well, what if we did this, modify this behavior in this way, you know, how under some set of assumptions would we expect to see that play out down the road in terms of different outcomes? And so you could very much imagine if we were able to incorporate more economic indicators as well, then you could have kind of, you know, a, a what if where you could look at modifying behaviors that, you know, which we could tie to some specific intervention, perhaps in collaboration with the retailer, you know, how would that then translate into likely changes in population health status and in financial outcomes as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm shifting back to you, Jay. And thank you very much, David, also uh, for an excellent uh, webinar and discussion. Uh, back to you, Jay. Um, thank you, Laura. Thanks, David. We, we have a few uh, questions coming in from Azeda, uh, asking, how does the code of ethics come into play in making AI? And any suggestions as to what sectors need to come in to ensure the ethical side of this is looked into when using AI? Uh, ethical side. I'm not sure if it uh, could whoever asked the question perhaps clear, uh, give me a little more context as to what you're thinking there. Uh, so I'm sorry. I mean, I was just thinking when uh, we have this sort of information, um, how other uh, industries could 
how could we use it in a negative way? And I think in any tool that's the case. But um, I was just wondering if uh, you might have some suggestions that um, basically how we can better use it in a positive way as opposed to negative. So, for example, you find out that um, in certain regions um, where they're more vulnerable in terms of uh, in terms of economy. Um, they don't make the like, they don't make choices that people actually make like, buy junk food, for example, uh, more as opposed to healthier. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That 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 helps to clarify. Um, well, you know, I think that I mean that's sort of one of the things we looked at in that example I gave about uh, discounting and soft drinks. I mean, our, our first first thing we want to look at is is there any evidence that that discounting is occurring systematically? Uh, according to socioeconomic status, you know, and had had we seen something like that, that would be a bit concerning. It would suggest that, you know, it would you know it could be it could be a coincidence, but it might also suggest that retailers had already looked at these data and had already realized this association and were somehow trying to you know maximize profits by targeting those regions preferentially. We did not see that, um, and you know, I guess. You know, I think well, we need to make an important distinction between um, individual level data and area level data. Certainly, whenever we're talking about, you know, connecting individual level shopping data to, say, health data, that is something that would, could only possibly, I think, be done with individual consent engagement and with an individual kind of driving what happens with that and, and you know, controlling where those data go. So, for example, that linkage might occur in a way that the health data are never made available to, or should probably occur in the way the health data are never made available available to, say, a grocery retailer because it's not really relevant to them, but it could come together in some environment that could, you know, be useful to the individual. But I think the other point, too, is you can think about this at a population scale, right? So um, as you point out, you, you could end up um, in some sense uh, stigmatizing certain populations. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's I, mean, I think industries like insurance industries, for example, and others are already accessing these kinds of data and looking at them in a similar way to the work that, that we're looking at them. So I think probably the best strategy to ensure that there is sort of a, and you know, that people are advancing here in an ethical way is transparency. So, you know, if we're looking at the same data all the time and we're looking and, for example, seeing if there are patterns of differential uh, marketing across those, those, those subpopulations, you know, I think that's a way to try and you know make sure that we're 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 towing the line. But um, I do I do think it's a good question. We have to very much think about, and I don't think it's just an AI question. I think it, it it can occur with all sorts of different analytic strategies. But as we gather more data, we can to begin to better define subpopulations and understand what behaviors they're taking and so on. We have to think about how that can you know enforce stereotypes or lead to stigmatization and so on. Um, but on the flip side, looking at data in this way also allows us to really quantify inequalities um, and and to measure where we're going with those inequalities in the sense are we, you know, with given interventions that we take, are we reducing inequalities or are we increasing inequalities? That's something that we can actually uh, look at. And so I think, again, from a transparency perspective, you know, as long as we're, we're transparent with these, this information at that, that population scale, I think it can be can be a great benefit. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, do we have any other questions uh, from the audience? All right. Uh, so if there are no other questions, uh, I, I, it's been a very interesting talk, and uh, uh, especially uh, myself coming in as a, uh, an outsider, not really uh, familiar with this work. I, 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 I thought it was accessible and uh, really glad that I was able to uh, to hear it. And thank you for the questions from everybody. So uh, I think uh, unless Laurette has any uh, closing comments, we could uh, we could conclude the webinar. Uh, just conclude uh, with the next uh, webinar that we have been announcing, which is Atula Genage. We are not sure yet about the actual pronunciation. Uh, which is a computer science expert coming this time from Australia uh, that do specialize in ontology, uh, knowledge extraction, and digital ecosystem uh, building uh, because we are really
moving toward bridging uh, agriculture, public health, healthcare, food, banking, uh, and uh, uh, an insurance from a perspective of bringing solution, a societal scale solution that allow us to go beyond what we have been able to do so far along the sustainable development and affordable health and healthcare for all. And uh, this, uh, we know that it will be in the week of July uh, 26. Uh, we don't know yet precisely what time, uh, but that is very much kind of a, a build up on uh, the 10 or 12 uh, webinar that we have been having in this series since its beginning um, about a year ago, I think. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you, David. Bye-bye.